The purpose of this video is to debate the statements made by Dr. Robert Carter and Dr. Jonathan Safati in their recent YouTube video on the subject of geocentrism. Robertson Jenis has written the script for this debate. He will answer all the challenges brought up by Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati, as well as point out the misconceptions, presumptions, and sometimes fallacious views they believe about geocentrism. Regarding academic degrees, Dr. Carter holds a PhD in marine biology and Dr. Safadi holds a PhD in physical chemistry, and Robertson Jenis holds a BA, MA, and PhD in religious studies. Although these respective academic degrees have little to do with geocentrism or cosmology in general, all three of the participants have studied the topic of geocentrism and physics sufficiently enough to be considered authorities on the subject. Our analysis will work as follows. We will let Dr. Carter and or Dr. Safadi state their position on a particular topic and if we have something to say, we will pause the video and begin debating the point at that time. Once we are finished with a particular section, we will resume with Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati until we need to interrupt again. The debate will proceed like this until the end. Well, hello and welcome to Creation.com Talk. I'm Dr. Robert Carter. I'm joined with my dear friend, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, and today we are talking about a subject that has vexed theologians and scientists for thousands of years. This is the geocentrism debate. Yeah, good day, everyone. Uh, it's important to realize that globe Earth, not flat Earth, globe Earth geocentrism was a ruling astronomical paradigm for about 2,000 years. I mean, it starts from probably Aristotle and then went right up to Kepler and Newton before it was finally overturned. Also, we have to understand that the, the reformers, the ancient theologians, the philosophers, they were following the ruling science of the day. It, the science told us that everything goes around the earth. That's what it appears from first principles. It took a long time to figure out that that wasn't true. It's interesting, though, that the, you do have some dissenters, like even in the, in the medieval period, you have Buridan, uh, Nicola yeah. Reim, who is a bishop, and Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who is second only to the Pope, and they actually were seriously uh, challenging the idea that the earth was the center or that other things could also be considered the center and they were people in good standing they weren't persecuted by the church this is in the 14th century or so and interestingly right around that same time christianity started building massive cathedrals across europe and in a lot of those cathedrals were things included that allowed them to do astronomical observations. Specifically, a lot of cathedrals had a hole in the roof somewhere mm. that pointed south so they could capture sunlight, and an image of the sun would be projected on the floor of the cathedral on a line. And they could do, for year after year after year, astronomical measurements. That was actually the background leading to the rejection of the idea that the Earth is the center. It came from Christianity. Dr. Carter's statement is false on two counts. In 1616 and 1633, the Catholic Church officially condemned both Copernicanism and Galileo. Since then, the Catholic Church has never made an official retraction of those two condemnations, now standing at 405 years. Even the speech by Pope John Paul II in 1992 did not rescind the decisions of the 1600s since his speech was not an official doctrinal declaration of the Catholic Church. Although there are certainly a lot of unofficial opinions swirling about that the Catholic Church has relaxed its condemnation of Copernicanism, the fact is that the 1616 and 1633 condemnations still stand today as the Church's last official doctrinal statements on the issue. The only possible mitigations are the 1821 imprimatur given to Canon Giuseppe Satelli for his book on heliocentrism, and the removal of Galileo's name from the 1835 Index of Forbidden Books. But not only did these two incidents not rescind the official doctrinal decisions of the Catholic Church against Galileo and heliocentrism, both these incidents were the results of blatant falsehoods told to the reigning Pope, Pius VII, by two members of his hierarchy, which makes both the imprimatur for Satelli and the removal of Galileo from the index, technically invalid. For example, when in 1765 French astronomer, Joseph Lalande, went to the Vatican to ask to have Galileo's book taken off the index of forbidden books, 
the Vatican explained to him that no such rescission could be made since the decrees of 1616 and 1633 against Galileo had never been revoked. For the record, the falsehood used to obtain the imprimatur for Canon St. Elie was engineered by Cardinal Maurizio Olivieri. Since Father Filippo Anfossi, the master of the sacred palace and the sole judge of whether a book would receive an imprimatur, would not let Canon St. Elie have an imprimatur, Cardinal Olivieri went around Father Anfossi directly to the Pope, Pius VII. Olivieri told Pope, Pius VII that the 1616 and 1633 Church did not condemn Galileo for teaching heliocentrism, but only for the non-elliptical version of heliocentrism he was teaching, but other than that, Galileo and the Church were pro-heliocentrism. This, of course, was a blatant lie since the Church of 1616 and 1633 had not even discussed the issue of planetary orbits, much less whether they had to be elliptical. In fact, Kepler and his elliptical orbits were later put on the index of forbidden books in 1664 by Pope Alexander VII. Moreover, since all the records of Galileo's 1633 trial conducted by Pope Urban VIII had been confiscated from the Vatican Library in 1809 by Napoleon Bonaparte during the reign of Pius VII, there was little the Pope could do to counter Olivieri's lie. Thus Pius VII, weak as he was known to be as a pope, capitulated to Olivieri's falsehood, and thus Satelli was given an imprimatur for his heliocentric book. Another important incident in Cardinal Olivieri's charade is that his cohort to obtain the imprimatur for Canon Satelli was Cardinal Bartolomeo Capillari. Ten years after Satelli received the imprimatur in 1821, then, in 1831, Cardinal Capillari became Pope Gregory XVI. Four years later, Pope Gregory took Galileo's name off the Index of Forbidden Books, and did so without any explanation, obviously attempting to bypass the 1616 and 1633 doctrinal decrees against Galileo and Copernicanism, without due protocol. As one might expect, this whole incident has been covered up by those favorable to Galileo and heliocentrism. Well, there's meridian lines in the cathedrals because the cathedrals yeah. were the best buildings of the of the Middle Ages, possibly of all time. They're just quite amazing buildings, very stable buildings. So you can get they, these are the best astronomical instruments until quite late in the development of telescopes. The, the earliest telescopes had nothing on the meridian lines uh, until quite late, several hundred years later. And it's really, really fascinating looking at those meridian lines. Now, I haven't seen one yet, but my bucket list, on my bucket list, mm. is a trip to Europe to visit as many of those as I can find. I know they still exist, and they're right there on the floor, and most people walk right over them without even realizing Meridian lines have little to do with determining whether the Earth rotates and revolves or is fixed in the center and the universe revolves around it. Both the heliocentric and geocentric systems can account for the meridian lines with respect to the building in which they are displayed. That is because science has accepted that whether it is the Galilean relativity of the Middle Ages or the Marcian, and Einsteinian relativity of the modern day, the movement of celestial bodies can be geocentric or heliocentric, since both will produce what we see in the sky. This also means, however, that former proofs of heliocentrism, such as stellar parallax, stellar aberration, Doppler shift, etc., have all been discredited since it can be shown quite easily that all celestial movements can be explained from the geocentric model, particularly, the neo tyconian model of geocentrism. So Jonathan, mm -hmm. we've heard a lot of this debate. We've spent hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. working on documents to support um, the modern view and arguing with people who hold the older view. And there's a strain that we see in a lot of all this. And it's an idea that maybe paganism was driving this idea and that people were trying to elevate the sun to some center of importance as if the sun was going to be worshipped or something like that. Well, this is totally anachronistic because uh, going right back to Aristotle, the earth was the lowest place in the universe where all the, the dregs fell naturally. So the heavens were special. The further away you were from the center, the better you were. So in fact, going from geo to helio was actually a promotion, not a, not a demotion. 
okay? And you look at Dante's Divine Comedy, well, where was uh, Satan found? He was found right in the middle of the of the center of the round earth. This is about the 12th century, uh, Satan in the center of a globe. And the further away he went, the, the higher the heavens were, the more exalted they were. Yeah, now granted, that's not necessarily biblical Christianity, but it is the philosophy of the day. Mm. And if we compare this to the philosophy of the day, we can realize no, no one was worshiping That may the have sun. been true of many heliocentrists. But it was Copernicus himself that demonstrated what many philosophers consider a worship of the sun. In his famous book, De Revolutionibus, Copernicus says the following. Quote, in the middle of all sits sun enthroned. In this most beautiful temple could we place this luminary in any better position from which he can illuminate the whole at once. He is rightly called the lamp, the mind, the ruler of the universe. Hermes Trismegistus names him the visible god. Sophocles Electra calls him the all-seeing. So the sun sits as upon a royal throne ruling his children the planets which circle around him. The earth has the moon at her service. As Aristotle says, in his On Animals, the moon has the closest relationship with the earth. Meanwhile the earth conceives by the sun, and becomes pregnant with an annual rebirth. Unquote. As Karl Popper understood this to mean. Quote, Copernicus studied in Bologna under the Platonist Novara, and Copernicus's idea of placing the sun rather than the earth in the center of the universe was not the result of new observations but of a new interpretation of old and well-known facts in the light of semi-religious Platonic and Neoplatonic ideas. The crucial idea can be traced back to the sixth book of Plato's Republic, where we can read that the sun plays the same role in the realm of visible things as does the idea of the good in the realm of ideas. Now the idea of the good is the highest in the hierarchy of Platonic ideas. Accordingly, the sun, which endows visible things with their visibility, vitality, growth, and progress, is the highest in the hierarchy of the visible things in nature. Now if the sun was to be given pride of place, if the sun merited a divine status, then it was hardly possible for it to revolve about the earth. The only fitting place for so exalted a star was the center of the universe. So the earth was bound to revolve about the sun. This platonic idea, then, forms the historical background of the Copernican revolution. It does not start with observations, but with a religious or mythological idea. Unquote. Taken from Popper's book, Conjectures and Refutations, The Growth of Scientific Knowledge, page 187. Popper also said on page 257. Quote, the Copernican system, for example, was inspired by a Neoplatonic worship of the light of the sun who had to occupy the center because of his nobility. This indicates how myths may develop testable components. They may, in the course of discussion, become fruitful and important for science. Unquote. So there's a lot of politics involved in this and a lot of angst. And it's interesting as a mirror of today how secular science can sometimes slow down scientific progress mm -hmm. because of human, human personalities. What's interesting, who actually encouraged uh, Copernicus to publish was, was Reticus, who was a protege of, of Melanchthon, who was an ally of Martin Luther, the reformer. Okay, so you had uh, church people encouraging Copernicus to publish, but he knew that he was going against science. Copernicus spent night after night after night looking at the stars and measuring the positions of planets and stars. And as he's taking all these measurements, he's realizing that the data much more easily fit the idea that the sun is the middle of the solar system and all the planets go around the sun. As for Socrates' mm -hmm. statement, quote, churchmen were encouraging Copernicus to publish, unquote, this is largely false. Neither Martin Luther nor Philip Melanchthon, the two highest churchmen of Lutheranism, supported either Copernicus or Raeticus, or any heliocentrist. This is quite easily discovered with a little research. Luther calls Copernicus, quote, a fool who went against holy writ, unquote. Like many of his day, 
Luther used Joshua 10 and Joshua's stopping of the sun as biblical refutation against heliocentrism. As for Melanchthon, he lectured against Copernicus and told his students to avoid him because he defied scripture. As for Carter's assertion that Copernicus spent hours and hours charting the paths of the planets and was thus finally satisfied that his heliocentric model did the job much better than Ptolemy's model, this is little more than a myth. The germ of Copernicus' idea came from the Greek philosopher, Pythagoras, in the 6th century BC, and later promoted by Aristarchus in the 3rd century BC, not by Copernicus providing meticulous calculations of the cosmos. Arthur Kestler, who did one of the most detailed and expansive examinations of Copernicus's book, said the following. Quote, Canon Copernic was not particularly fond of stargazing. He preferred to rely on the observations of Chaldeans, Greeks, and Arabs, a preference that led him to some embarrassing results. The Book of the Revolutions contains, altogether, only 27 observations made by the canon himself, and these were spread over 32 years. Even in the position he assumed for his basic star, the spiker, which he used as a landmark, was erroneous by about 42 minutes of arc, more than the width of the moon. Unquote. Taken from Kessler's, The Sleepwalkers, page 125. Along these lines, Thomas Kuhn reveals more modern misconceptions of Copernicus. Quote, but this apparent economy of the Copernican system, though it is a propaganda victory that the proponents of the new astronomy rarely failed to emphasize, is largely an illusion. The seven-circle system presented in the first book of the De Revolutionibus, and in many modern elementary accounts of the Copernican system, is a wonderfully economical system, but it does not work. It will not predict the position of planets with an accuracy comparable to that supplied by Ptolemy's system. Unquote. Taken from Kuhn's, The Copernican Revolution, Planetary Astronomy in the Development of Western Thought, 1957, page 169. As noted by Paul Firebend, it is in the commentary Olus, written in 1510, that Copernicus makes his first claim that the Ptolemaic system is unsatisfactory, yet admits on page 57 that Ptolemy's model is, quote, consistent with the data, unquote. From Firebend's book, Against Method, page 71, note 14. Next, Bernard Cohen adds. Quote, In both De Revolutionibus and the Commentriolus, Copernicus attacks Ptolemaic astronomy not only because in it the sun moves rather than the earth, but because Ptolemy has not strictly adhered to the precept that all celestial motions must be explained only by uniform circular motions or combinations of such circular motions. Unquote. From Cohen's, Revolution in Science, 1985, page 112. Despite all the introductory fanfare, De Revolutionibus was certainly not a smash hit in the annals of book publishing. The first run was a thousand copies, which never sold out. There were only four reprints in the next 400 years. Compared to other books on astronomy being sold at that time, including Ptolemy's Almagest, whose reprints were in the hundreds, De Revolutionibus had one reprint prior to 1700. One reason for its unpopularity was its unreadability. It was choppy, obtuse, and pedantic. The thrust of the theory fills fewer than 20 pages at the beginning of the book, roughly 5% of the whole treatise. More than half the book is filled with useless charts that prove nothing for Copernicus's case. When the book reaches its end, there is little left of the original teaching, and thus Copernicus can offer no concluding statement, even though it was promised many times in the text. Truth be told, the main reason for its unpopularity was that it offered no real improvement over Ptolemy's system. In the introduction, Copernicus claims to have rid cosmology of Ptolemy's somewhat cumbersome epicyclical system, which had been in use for over a thousand years. Copernicus's solar system was in many instances more complicated than Ptolemy's. What Copernicus claimed as simplicity is one thing, what his work shows is quite another. 
Even a cursory reading of De Revolutionibus reveals that the model he proposed was complicated and uncertain. As Kessler puts it, quote, What we call the Copernican Revolution was not made by Canon Copernicus. His book was not intended to cause a revolution. He knew much of it was unsound, contrary to evidence, and its basic assumption unprovable. Unquote. Taken from The Sleepwalkers, page 151. So reticent was Copernicus to publish his work for fear of ridicule that his fellow heliocentric friend, Joachim Reticus, wishing to obscure the true author, published a summary of the contents and attributed the work to, quote, the learned Dr. Nicholas of Torun, unquote, the town Copernicus was born. Kestler continues. Quote, As a result of all this, Canon Copernicus's life work seemed to be, for all useful purposes, wasted. From the seafarers and stargazers' point of view, the Copernican planetary tables were only a slight improvement on the earlier Alphonsine tables, and were soon abandoned. And insofar as the theory of the universe is concerned, the Copernican system, bristling with inconsistencies, anomalies, and arbitrary constructions, was equally unsatisfactory, most of all to himself. In the lucid intervals between the long periods of torpor, the dying canon must have been painfully aware that he had failed. Unquote. From Kessler's, The Sleepwalkers, page 126. Some of the difficult if not impossible things with which Copernicus had to contend in making his model are the obliquity of the ecliptic, the intersection of the equator, ecliptic and meridian, the declinations and ascensions of stars, the angles of the ecliptic with the horizon, the precessions of solstices and equinoxes, the irregularities of the equinoctial precession, the magnitude and difference of the solar year, the irregularity of the sun's movement, the changes of the apsides, regular and apparent movement, the moon's complicated and irregular movement, the unequal apparent diameter of the moon and its parallaxes, the me oppositions and conjunctions of the sun and moon, ecliptic conjunctions, the irregular movements of the other planets, the latitudes of the planets, the planet's angles of obliquation, and other difficulties. All right, now let's go to a man named Galileo. Galileo postdates Copernicus. He comes later, mm -hmm. maybe even 80 years later, before he's really starting to publish a lot of material. Mm -hmm. And Galileo is famous in this debate because people were telling him he was wrong. Did the church, in fact, suppress Galileo? Well, again, you can probably find about 10 astronomers from Copernicus to Galileo who supported the a heliocentric view. Uh, the vast majority supported the the traditional view of the Earth at the center. In fact, it's, it's quite interesting to see that Galileo was a very good friend of the man who became the Pope, and the yes. Pope encouraged him to publish. Um, yes, but, but what changed the Pope's mind? What did Galileo foolishly do? Well, basically, Galileo insulted him because he wrote his his. his uh, his theory in a book of dialogues between a heliocentrist and a geocentrist, and he put the Pope's words in the mouth of the geocentrist, whom he named Simplicio, which means the fool. You see, so the Pope felt betrayed. Yes, politics, politics, and not papal politics, science. Yeah. You can't just go and insult a bunch of people when you're trying to make a point. Mm -hmm. Galileo was really. This is another man. long perpetuated just so story. Of all the Galileo historians. Maurice Finucciaro, who is pro-Galileo, has the best review of this alleged sour sentiment in Pope Urban VIII. But even he concludes that it is probably a myth because he found no documentation for its existence after over 40 years of research, as stated in his book, Retrying Galileo, 1633-1992, pages 185-188. The existing evidence shows that Pope Urban VIII, who put the final kibosh on Galileo, did so because of both Galileo's poor scientific proofs, his attempt to deliteralize the Bible, and his ignoring of the fathers of the Church. 
Indeed, Pope Urban had a running dialogue between September 1632 and June 1633 with the Grand Duke of Tuscany's ambassador, Francesco Nicolini, in letters that clearly demonstrate to the Grand Duke that the Pope's resolve against Galileo was based solely on the biblical, theological, and scientific inadequacies of Galileo's arguments. Pope Urban, in fact, classified Galileo's view as heresy since it went against the express dictates of both scripture and the patristic consensus. It would not be the first time that a cardinal, who at one point had one view, changed his mind about a point of doctrine once he became pope. In doing so, at the 1633 trial of Galileo, Urban VIII reiterated the charge of heresy against the Copernican doctrine that was formulated first in 1616 by the eleven examiners commissioned by the then Pope, Paul V. Although Galileo was not charged with heresy in 1616, he was canonically censored from ever teaching or writing about heliocentrism for the rest of his life. Galileo, under his presumed friendship with Cardinal Barberini, broke this canonical law and began writing his book, A Dialogue of the Two Great World Systems, in 1623. After he finished the book in 1631, he attempted to gain an imprimatur for it without the Pope's knowledge. Once the Pope found out about Galileo's subterfuge, he, the same Cardinal Barberini, who was now Pope Urban VIII, called Galileo to trial in Rome for his breach against the Church. The 1633 trial ended in the Church being lenient against Galileo and thus convicted him of being, quote, vehemently suspect of heresy, unquote, instead of being convicted of formal heresy. In the end, it is Carter and Safati, who make a fool of the Pope since they give the Pope no credit whatsoever for his adhering to the 1616 Magisterium's condemnation of Copernicanism that occurred 17 years earlier in 1616 under Pope Paul V. They also give no credit to Pope Urban for realizing that, after he was forced to study the matter thoroughly in preparation for the 1633 trial, found that the Bible was quite clear that the earth did not move and that the fathers were in consensus on that conclusion. Prior to Paul V and Urban VIII, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, published in 1566, stated in four places that the heavens were created geocentrically. Prior to the Catechism, all the qualified medieval theologians, except for Nicholas of Cusa, had believed and taught geocentrism, as did all the fathers of the Church, with no exceptions. Yeah, and so also, not only are we seeing politics, we're also seeing the fallibilities of the human mind. Mm -hmm. Scientists struggling with information, trying to conceptualize it, and trying to argue with themselves and fight cultural trends and contravening data and put all things into a into this big ball that we call the geocentric theory or the heliocentric theory the thing is heliocentrism isn't even the right word no it's not no. the sun is not the center of the solar system in fact the sun because of jupiter being so massive the sun actually wobbles in the center because Jupiter and Saturn, as they move around, they cause the sun to wobble. It's, it's a gravitationally balanced system. It's not a heliocentric system. And that has to wait till Newton. But yes, indeed, if we had aliens trying to find life, uh, planets around our sun, they would notice the sun's wobbling and realize this planet's moving it. So the sun is not the center. The, cen uh, the center is actually the, the Barry center, which means the center of mass of the whole system. That's the real center. It's close enough to the sun for most practical purposes, but the, the technical term would be Barry-centric solar system. It's the center of this mass, not the sun. This is technically correct, but considering the common history, it is not practical. Practically, we know that either the sun, planets, and stars revolve around a fixed Earth, or that the Earth rotates within a fixed star system. The conventional terms for these diametrically opposed systems are heliocentrism and geocentrism, respectively, and there is little reason to change them. We grant that the Sun shifts in the dynamic heliocentric model, but the planets still revolve around the Sun regardless of where the Sun slightly shifts. More importantly, the geocentric system is dynamically balanced also. If it weren't, then it wouldn't work. The difference between the two models is that, in the heliocentric system, 
the Sun shifts against the very center of the whole solar system, whereas in the geocentric system the universe itself wobbles or processes against its center of mass, a center of mass that both the Earth and the universe share together. It is this wobble of the universe that is responsible for such things as the 26,000-year precession and other minor movements, such as the Chandler wobble. But doesn't the Bible say that the Earth is the center of the universe? Doesn't the Bible trump all of the science and all these astronomical measurements? I mean, isn't it clear when you read Scripture that it talks about sunrise and sunset and all mm -hmm. these other things? It sure sounds like the Earth is the middle, according to the Bible. The Bible's true. I want to believe the Bible. Oh, me too. Yep. So isn't the Earth the center? Well, I mean, don't we say sunrise and sunset today? Because it's quite awkward to say, well, the, the Earth has rotated, so our line of sight to the sun has become tangential to the horizon. It's quite awkward to say that. Yes, I, I stumble over it, but so I say sun, sunrise and sunset, even though I'm not a geocentrist. And that's what fact, everyone says today. In fact, just about every single one of our mapping programs, online, GPS, satellites, even old-fashioned standard maps, you're not using the sun as a reference point when you're looking at a map. You're using fixed points on the Earth as reference points. Because the human brain can't say, oh, I'm going to go from Italy to France and figure out how far away I am from the sun and my angle of ex whatever. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. So we have fixed references all the time. And we use this phenomenological language all the time, constantly, because it's the way we communicate. Yeah, well, the, the uh, sat-nav or, or the uh, GPS uses the, your car as your reference frame and all the roads and streets move around you because it makes you the center of the universe. Yes, it does, actually. Okay. So if the Bible uses words like sunrise and sunset, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that the sun moves around the earth? It's just referring to our, our reference frame, just as I say, um, you're following a car and you might uh, tell the driver who's, got, who's tailgating, pull back a bit. Well, what you mean is slow down, but as far as you're, that you're, you're using the car in front of you as a reference frame. And so from that car's reference frame, you're saying pulling back from that car. You're not even using a geocentric frame there or a heliocentric frame. You're using the car in front of It is of true you as that the Bible frame. uses phenomenological language in words like sunrise and sunset, and both heliocentrists and geocentrists use those terms today in the phenomenological sense. Neither model, the geocentric nor the heliocentric, believes the sun actually rises at the beginning of the day and sets at the end of the day. No competent geocentrist would use such language to prove the world is geocentric. But this fact just begs the question, for since we see the sun rise over the Earth's horizon, we need to ask and answer the next obvious question, that is, what actually causes us to see a sunrise or sunset? We only have two choices, either the Earth is rotating under a fixed sun, or the sun is revolving around a fixed Earth. Both will produce what we call a sunrise or sunset. The real question, then, is this. If Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati wish to use the Bible as the final authority, as they do, for example, when they teach creationism against evolution, then what answer does the Bible provide us as to the real cause of the sunrise or sunset? Well, in its over two dozen passages that are directly related to this question, the Bible's answer is never that the earth rotates under a fixed sun or stars. It is always that the sun revolves around a fixed earth. And we are excluding all the passages that speak of a sunrise or sunset. The Bible answers this question by specifically insisting that the earth does not move. The Bible never says the earth is in any kind of lateral, diagonal, vertical, radial or translational motion. The only time the Bible designates movement to the Earth is when it is speaking of an earthquake or some other kind of surface movement of the Earth's land mass. But these are all internal movements that take place while the whole Earth itself is said not to move in relation to its external environment, the cosmos. In fact, the only time the Bible says the Earth will move is at the end of time when, as we know, God will replace this old heaven and Earth with a new heaven and new Earth, for all eternity. It is rather remarkable, from the scientific perspective, that the Bible specifies three states of the earth. In one state it does not move with respect to its external environment. In another state, 
it moves with respect to its internal environment. In its last state, it completely moves out of the way never to be seen again. Just the fact that the Bible makes a sharp distinction between the earth moving internally as opposed to its not moving externally shows that the Bible is scientifically sensitive to these kinds of geological facts. In other words, if the Bible is scientifically careful to say the earth moves internally, then it must be just as scientifically careful when it says that the earth does not move externally, otherwise Holy Writ is duplicitous in its understanding, which cannot be. As for the sun, the Bible always says the sun moves externally against the cosmos and never says it is fixed, and these particular biblical passages have nothing to do with sunrise and sunset. So, of the two possible explanations for sunrise and sunset, the Bible's evidence, without exception, is that they are caused by the sun moving around the earth, not the earth rotating. We have already seen that the fathers of the church and the medieval theologians unanimously interpreted this biblical information as propositional scientific truth. Hence in order to dismiss their exegesis of scripture, the next competent biblicist must have a substantial exegetical counter-argument, and not merely one that depends on the arbitrary use of phenomenological language in the Bible. For if we were permitted, based on our particular theological or scientific ideology, to interpret any passage in the Bible phenomenologically, such as the resurrection, Jesus as a man, miracles, prophecy, inspiration, the second coming of Christ, etc., then there would be nothing physical left to believe about the Bible. The sad fact is, some movements in Christianity have done just that. As for Dr. Safati's statement that, quote, it means the sun is following our reference frame, unquote. Once Dr. Safati moves the discussion to reference frames, it means he has admitted there is no way he can prove the earth rotates on an axis or revolves around the sun. As admitted by Einstein, the master of relative motion. Quote. The struggle, so violent in the early days of science, between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would then be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. Unquote. Taken from, The Evolution of Physics, From Early Concepts to Relativity and Quanta, by Albert Einstein and Leopold Infeld, 1938, page 212. Or as Stephen Hawking put it, Quote, so which is real, the Ptolemaic or the Copernican system. Although it is not uncommon for people to say that Copernicus proved Ptolemy wrong, that is not true. As in the case of our normal view versus that of the goldfish, one can use either picture as a model of the universe, for our observations of the heavens can be explained by assuming either the earth or the sun to be at rest. Unquote. Taken from the book, The Grand Design, by Stephen Hawking and Leonard Lodenau, 2010, page 41. Let's quote from one more famous scientist to round out the field, although there are literally dozens who say the same thing. Fred Hoyle, the man who coined the term, the Big Bang, put it this way. Quote. We can take either the Earth or the Sun, or any other point for that matter, as the center of the solar system. This is certainly so for the purely kinematical problem of describing the planetary motions. It is also possible to take any point as the center even in dynamics, although recognition of this freedom of choice had to await the present century. Unquote. Taken from Hoyle's book titled, Nicholas Copernicus, 1973, page 82. You pointed out a very interesting reference frame uh, reference in the book of Acts that I had never seen before. What was that? Oh, it's, uh, you have to go to either a very literal translation or to the original Greek. Acts 27, 27 uh, says, Towards the middle of the night, the sailors began sensing land to be drawing near to them. So what you call oh. this is actually nautico-centric. It's the center of uh, the reference frame is the ship they're on. So from that reference frame, the, the land is drawing towards them. 
as opposed to you're moving towards the land. That's what the Greek says. It's very clear in the Greek. First, although the Greek can be read as if the land is moving toward the boat, one needs to take into account that the incident of Acts 27 takes place at night, and at night it is hard to know if your boat is moving, since one cannot see any reference points in the water. Second, it would be better to call the experience of the men in Acts 27 an illusion rather than an example of relative motion, since we know that the land did not move then, nor can it move in the future in order to qualify as true relative motion. In other words, relative motion assumes that both objects, the boat and the land, possess the possibility of regular motion. If one body is always fixed, then there is no relative motion. Similarly, if the earth is fixed in the center of the universe, then there is no relative motion, since all motion can be measured absolutely against the fixed earth. Be that as it may, Dr. Safati himself points out that the men in the boat, from a scientific perspective, know that land does not move toward a boat and thus the men are able to put the proper interpretation on their phenomenological experience. Likewise, we must insist that the same thing is true for those who assume the responsibility to interpret scripture correctly, even as Dr. Safati does when he claims to interpret scripture's references to a sunrise or sunset as merely phenomenological. In such cases, exegetes of scripture have been traditionally taught that they must depend on more objective passages of scripture that will provide a clearer answer. When we do so in the case of scripture's references to sunrise and sunset, we find that scripture's more objective passages always say it is because the sun moves and the earth is fixed, never the opposite. Let's look at an example of one of those more objective passages that give us the cause for events like sunrise or sunset. In the Old Testament book of Joshua chapter 10, we read the following in verses 12 through 14. Quote, then Joshua spoke to the Lord, in the day that he delivered the Amorites in the sight of the children of Israel, and he said before them, Move not, O sun, toward Gibeon, nor thou, O moon, toward the valley of Ijalon. And the sun and the moon stood still, till the people revenged themselves of their enemies. Is not this written in the book of the just? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down the space of one day. There was not before, nor after, so long a day, the Lord obeying the voice of a man, and fighting for Israel. Unquote. One of the more important features of this chapter is God's direct involvement in the situation. God does three things. In verse 10 he puts the enemies into panic. In verse 11, he throws down great hailstones. In verses 12 to 14 he causes the sun and moon to stand still. As such, we are in the realm of miraculous events far removed from natural occurrences. According to the account, Joshua was standing in Gibeon when he made his request to the Lord to stop the sun. The sun was directly overhead, near the noontime position, as verse 13 says, quote, the sun stayed in the middle of heaven, unquote. The word middle or midst, is from the Hebrew, kotzi, meaning middle or half, as used in Exodus 24 6, and Joshua 1 12, 8 33, and 12 2. Joshua also sees the moon, but it is west of the sun. Perhaps Joshua made the request at midday because, after fighting the Amorites from the early morning, he could see by the early afternoon he was not going to have enough time to finish the battle by sundown, especially since, according to verse 5, he was fighting five different armies at one time. Additionally, since Gibeon is at an elevation of between 2,400 and 3,000 feet above sea level, the sun, which had been rising from the east, is now positioned directly over the heads of Joshua and his army who are looking downward, west-southwest, upon the five enemy armies. This view provides Joshua with a very formidable weapon that is still used today in warfare, that is, the glare of the sun. With the sun directly in their eyes as they look upward toward Joshua's army, the enemy armies would be severely disadvantaged as they had to deal with partial blindness. Having the sun remain in this position for over 24 hours would be to Joshua's distinct advantage. 
as he makes the request for the sun to stand still and sees God answer him, Joshua sees that the moon has stopped over the Ijalon Valley. This valley begins about 15 miles west of Gibeon, and extends westward another 15 miles through Giza, until the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Joshua is in Gibeon, which is located in the Judean mountain range. At Gibeon, Joshua is elevated about 2500 feet. He will be able to see westward about 60 or so miles before the earth's curvature limits his line of vision. In order for the moon to be above the Ijalon valley in Joshua's line of vision, the moon must be at least 10 to 30 degrees above the horizon. The higher Joshua's elevation at Gibeon, the lower in the sky the moon must be in order to be above the Ijalon valley. If Joshua is seeing the moon about 30 or so degrees above the horizon, then the moon is about 60 degrees from the sun, since the sun is at the 90 degree mark, quote, in the middle of the sky, unquote. At this angle, the moon would not be in full phase, but between the third quarter and full phase, yet closer to the former. In the third quarter, the moon is in the middle sky as the sun rises, but it begins to set in the west when the sun reaches the middle sky at noon. All in all, the account conforms with all the astronomical facts concerning the occupation of the sun and moon in the sky. Joshua's narrative of this miraculous event, as required by the Hebrew law to have two or three witnesses for legal verification of an event, has as one of its witnesses, quote, the Book of Yashar, or, as it is sometime called, the Book of the Just. Joshua cites the Book of Yashar because it serves to authenticate the event, since the passage itself admits that stopping the orbits of both the sun and moon is one of the most astounding events ever to occur in human history. Anyone familiar at that time with the book of Yasha could consult the text to authenticate the testimony of the Hebrew Bible. Whether the book of Yasha exists today is in debate, but the fact remains that the Hebrew writer puts his testimony of the miraculous event on the line, as it were, allowing it to be checked and verified by any independent party who sought an affirming witness. The book of Yasha is itself authenticated since it is cited by the Bible in 2 Samuel 1:18. Quote, and he said it should be taught to the people of Judah, behold, it is written in the book of Yashar, unquote. For the third witness to Joshua's long day, the Hebrew Bible reiterates the account in Habakkuk 3.11. Quote, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows as they sped, at the flash of thy glittering spear, unquote. Habakkuk reiterates the exact details of Joshua's account as it specifies both the sun and the moon ceased their movements. The book of Habakkuk was written in the 7th century BC while Joshua was written in the 11th century BC, thus showing how the tradition survived intact over the next four centuries. Additionally, the event is also recorded in Sirach 46.5. Quote, Was not the sun stopped in his anger, and one day made as two. Unquote. Sirach was written just prior to the Maccabean Revolt, circa 160 BC, which now makes the testimony of Joshua's long day endure for at least a thousand years. Obviously, this is no ordinary day. So spectacular is this incident that the text ends with, quote, There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Unquote. Since the narrator describes this incident as the most spectacular that ever occurred, one must accept that the sun and moon stayed in their respective places for a whole day without moving. As such, one cannot interpret the passage as being merely symbolic, since that kind of interpretation would not measure up to the spectacularity of the event, and that it occurred only once in all of human history. Exegetical details of Joshua 10 10 to 14. Many progressive scholars hold that Joshua's long day is merely a fictional account of a typical battle in the annals of Israeli history. In their view, it is merely an embellished story that attributes a decisive victory to the Hebrew God, but in reality it was a normally fought battle that lasted at least two days. These conclusions, of course, discount any divine miracles taking place in the narrative. 
The difficulty for these scholars, besides relegating the narrative to mere legend and thus an historical falsehood, is that the miraculous intrusions are interwoven so inextricably within the details of the passage that it is impossible to separate them without destroying the actual history of the narrative. Of course, as many liberal exegetes have discovered to their dismay, separating the miraculous from the historical always results in destroying both. Other interpreters, although recognizing the validity of miracles, seek to minimize the possibility that Joshua 10 occurred as it is written. These scholars appeal to the Hebrew word damam, the word that is translated as, stood still, in verse 13, quote, and the sun and the moon stood still, unquote. Since the Hebrew damam also means silent, these scholars posit that Joshua is not saying the sun and moon were moving and then stopped. Rather, they claim, the word silent is merely a poetic way of describing Israel's victory over the Amorites using celestial metaphors, as if the sun and moon were hushed with amazement. In reality, escape from the literal interpretation is not so easy. Although one might make an argument that silent is a permitted translation of the Hebrew word damam, if we look deeper into the etymology, damam is a word that, in every case, ceases the action of the thing in view. For example, if a person is talking, the mam is used to denote the person has ceased talking, and therefore he is silent, such as in Psalm 31 17, quote, let the wicked be put to shame, let them be silent in shoal, unquote. But if an object is moving, the mam is used to denote that the object has stopped its motion, as in 1 Samuel 14 9, quote, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up." Unquote. In short, whatever the activity, the Hebrew word damam is employed when that activity has come to an end. For the record, damam appears thirty times in the Old Testament, and is understood in the following ways, silent, Leviticus 10.3, cut off, 1 Samuel 2.9, stand still, 1 Samuel 14.9, still, Exodus 15.16, ceasing, Psalm 35:15, devastated, Jeremiah 25:37, destroyed, Jeremiah 49:26, or rest, Lamentations 2:18. Hence, if the salient feature of the sun is its movement in the sky, damam would be the proper word to use if the sun's movement ceased. Other interpreters claim that verse 13's wording, quote, "So the sun stood in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down the space of one day." Unquote, shows by the words go down that the passage is using phenomenological language. The reason is that in the geocentric system, the sun does not actually go down, rather, it circles the earth and thus the sun only appears as if it is going down against the earth's horizon. But this argument is neutralized by the fact that the original Hebrew word, labo, does not translate as go down, but only as, go. In this way, the passage is entirely literal, since the word in question is not speaking of the direction of the sun but only of the movement of the sun. Once divine miracles are accepted as an integral part of the Joshua account, another issue for consideration is whether the sun itself was stopped, which necessitates that it was previously in motion. Or whether the earth was stopped in rotation, which necessitates that the sun was not in motion. The most significant piece of evidence in favor of the former is that even modern heliocentric science, which holds that the Earth rotates on an axis and revolves around the Sun, agrees that the Moon moves in space. In fact, the Moon moves independently of the Sun and stars and it revolves around the Earth every 28 days or so. That being the case, if behind the actual meaning of Joshua chapter 10 were the possibility that the Earth was in rotation, and thus the passage is attempting to give us a phenomenal perspective, it would be rather self-defeating for the author to include the cessation of the moon's movement. Since both the ancient and modern observer agree that the moon revolves around the earth independently of the sun and the stars, then it must be stopped from doing so if it is to be legitimately considered to have ceased its movement. Consequently, since in the normal course of events the moon is in constant motion around the earth, Yet on this particular day its movement ceased, 
the honest exegete is forced to conclude that the cause for the moon's cessation of movement, would not be the cessation of a rotating earth, but an external force that acted directly upon the moon, as well as the sun, to stop them both from continuing their normal daily revolution around the earth. The reason for this conclusion is plain. In the heliocentric system, the earth rotates, and although if the earth stopped rotating it would appear as if the sun stood still, the moon would still be revolving around the earth and continue to move while the sun remained still. Hence, Joshua's request could not be fulfilled by stopping the earth from rotating. We must also add that Joshua's request would also be impossible to fulfill by stopping the universe and its stars from rotating around the earth, since the sun and the moon move independently of the stars. Since the distance from the earth to the moon is about 240,000 miles, the circumference of the moon's orbit is 1,500,000 miles, which the moon travels in 28 days. Hence, in one day the moon travels about 54,000 miles. Hence, in one day this 54,000 mile distance would take it beyond the valley of Ijalon and below the horizon, and thus the moon would no longer be seen by Joshua on that day. As such, the geocentric system, is the only one that can satisfactorily answer the events in Joshua 10. Since in the geocentric system both the sun and the moon daily revolve around the earth, then both the sun and the moon must necessarily cease their movement simultaneously to satisfy Joshua's request. The heliocentric system cannot satisfy Joshua's request, for from Joshua's perspective the moon would simply move too far in one day to fulfill the specification in the text that it remained over the valley of Ijalon, for one extra day. Really cool. Just the fact that there's a reference frame argument like that, a relative reference frame argument. They're talking about what they saw. Here comes land. It looks like the land is moving. Of course they knew the land wasn't moving. Everyone so, yeah. knows that, but you just describe it that way because that's the way we talk. Dr. Carter's argument cuts both ways. If he is going to use the reference frame argument to justify that the Earth rotates under a fixed sun, the same reference frame argument can be used against Dr. Carter's position, since modern relativistic science has already agreed that it is only a matter of a coordinate transformation that will allow someone to claim the Earth rotates under a fixed sun, or that the sun revolves around a fixed Earth. Neither position can be proven or falsified from a reference frame point of view. So the appeal to relative motion only weakens Dr. Carter's argument, not bring him any closer to his desire to exonerate heliocentrism as the correct model. This brings us back to a previous point that Dr. Carter made when he claimed that the heliocentric reference frame is not really heliocentric, rather, in his words, it is a, quote, gravitationally balanced system, unquote. What Dr. Carter is referring to is the Newtonian system, the one he prefers. Consequently, he will only argue from the perspective of reference frames when he is dealing with phenomenological language in the Bible, for example, the sun rising or setting, or the boat and land of Acts 27. As such he consistently avoids dealing with the dynamic forces in alternative reference frames, especially those laid out in Einstein's general relativity. Perhaps the reason why he avoids these alternatives is that he knows Einstein's general relativity supports a geocentric system. To demonstrate this, we will need do a short analysis of the Newtonian system and show how even Dr. Carter's preferred model comes up short in dealing with the actual reality. First, one must understand that the Newtonian system is built on a non-relativistic or absolute reference frame, and second, the operation of that system is confined to our solar system. This is opposed to the general relativistic system that is built on a relative frame that is not absolute, that is, it can move, bend, or change, and can include the whole universe. In the Newtonian system, for a moving planet to travel in a straight line by its own inertia, and at the same time be pulled in by the gravity of the sun so that the planet would then divert to a curved path around the sun, it is required that the space in which the planet moves must be absolutely fixed. If the space moved, then it could not be said that the planet was seeking to move in a straight line. In other words, 
In order to have the straight lines of Newtonian motion, space cannot move or bend. Two hundred years later Ernest Mach explained to the physics world that Newton did not have the right to assert that space or the universe is absolute, since in making such an assertion it means that Newton imported a foreign metaphysical element into his system, which is not permitted in empirical science. As philosopher and scientist Bertrand Russell put it. Quote, Whether the earth rotates once a day from west to east, as Copernicus taught, or the heavens revolve once a day from east to west, as his predecessors believed, the observable phenomena will be exactly the same. This shows a defect in Newtonian dynamics, since an empirical science ought not to contain a metaphysical assumption, which can never be proved or disproved by observation. And no observations can distinguish the rotation of the earth from the revolutions of the heavens. Unquote. Taken from Dennis Siama's, The Unity of the Universe, 1961, pages 102 and 103. This defect came about when Newton decided to use dynamic force laws, as opposed to the mere geometry that Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler used, to demonstrate how the solar system operated. The defect in Newton's system manifested itself because when he applied his famous equation, F equals ma, to the operation of the solar system, he found that he had to add foreign forces into his equation to make it work in circular moving or accelerated frames, such as when the planets go around the sun. As Wikipedia describes this matter, these additional forces are termed inertial forces, fictitious forces or pseudo-forces. By accounting for the rotation by addition of these fictitious forces, Newton's laws of motion can be applied to a rotating system as though it was an inertial system. They are correction factors which are not required in a non-rotating system. In other words, Newton's system, the very system that claims to have solved the question left over by Kepler of how a planet can revolve around the Sun, in reality, Newton cannot answer the question unless he incorporates additional forces that are not part of its mechanical system. As such, Newton's mechanics fails to tell us how the solar system operates, but it has covered up this problem by calling the additional forces, quote, fictitious or pseudo-forces, unquote, as if they just appear all by themselves and have no concrete source. In the geocentric model, there is no such problem. By going beyond Newton, that is, first, by including the universe outside our solar system, and second, by allowing the same universe to move and not be absolute, geocentrism finds that the so-called fictitious forces of Newton's system are actually real forces that originate from the angular momentum of a rotating universe, and we identify them as the centrifugal, Coriolis, and Euler forces. Einstein realized the same thing, and he added that because Newton could not see this truth concerning the real origin of the additional forces, then Newton's system, Einstein said, had defects. As Einstein put it. Quote. One need not view the existence of centrifugal forces as originating from the motion of K', prime, the Earth. One could just as well account for them as resulting from the average rotational effect of distant detectable masses, the stars and galaxies, as evidenced in the vicinity of K', prime, the Earth, whereby K', prime, the Earth, is treated as being at rest. If Newtonian mechanics disallows such a view, then this could very well be the foundation for the defects of that theory. Unquote. Taken from Hans Thiering's paper, On the Effect of Rotating Distant Masses in Einstein's Theory of Gravitation, 1918. In other words, Newton's system must consider the appearance of centrifugal force, that is, the outward force a planet would feel as it revolved around the Sun, not as a real force but as a fictitious force, that is, fictitious in the sense that the force felt by the planet is only the result of curved motion around the Sun, but it cannot be a real force. But Einstein said, not necessarily so. Einstein said that a centrifugal force will be felt if the universe of stars revolves around an Earth at rest. The important distinction, Einstein added, is that the centrifugal force experienced when the universe of stars rotates around a fixed Earth will be a real force, not a fictitious one. That is, 
The centrifugal force is not felt because the planet changes direction, but because there are real centrifugal forces created by the angular momentum of a rotating universe that impose themselves on all celestial bodies. It is because Newton did not discover this truth that Einstein said his system had defects. We should add, however, that in a recent discovery of the last page of Newton's famous work, The Principia, Newton admits that if he included forces from the rest of the universe, then it was possible to have a geocentric system. Nobel laureate, Steven Weinberg, discovered this addition to Newton's Principia, and he describes it in his 2015 book, To Explain the World. Quote, if we were to adopt a frame of reference like Tycho's in which the Earth is at rest, then the distant galaxies would seem to be executing circular turns once a year, and in general relativity this enormous motion would create forces akin to gravitation, which would act on the Sun and planets and give them the motions of the Tychonic theory. Newton seems to have had a hint of this. In an unpublished Proposition 43 that did not make it into the Principia, Newton acknowledges that Tycho's theory could be true if some other force besides ordinary gravitation acted on the Sun and planets. Unquote. Here are Newton's exact words from Proposition 43 as translated from the Latin of his Principia Mathematica. Quote, in order for the Earth to be at rest in the center of the system of the Sun, planets and comets, there is required both universal gravity and another force in addition that acts on all bodies equally according to the quantity of matter in each of them, and is equal and opposite to the accelerative gravity with which the Earth tends to the Sun. 4. Such a force, acting on all bodies equally and along parallel lines, does not change their position among themselves, and permits bodies to move among themselves through the force of universal gravity in the same way as if it were not acting on them. Since this force is equal and opposite to its gravity toward the Sun, the Earth can truly remain in equilibrium between these two forces and be at rest. And thus, celestial bodies can move around the Earth at rest, as in the Tychonic system. Unquote. Taken from George E. Smith's essay titled, Newtonian Relativity, A Neglected Manuscript, An Understressed Corollary, published, 2015. In the end, it is easy to see that once we expand Newton's limited world of the Sun and its planets to the universe itself, even the staunchest Copernican of his day can suddenly become a geocentrist. The way we talk. Okay, but doesn't the Bible also say things like the earth shall not be moved? And, and if it also, the earth shall yeah. not be moved, that mm -hmm. means the earth doesn't move, right? Well, except that, of course, you got the righteous shall not be moved. Same uh, Hebrew word, yeah. Psalm 121. So righteous shall not be moved. Um, the psalmist also says, I shall not be moved. Does that mean he's in a straitjacket? It doesn't, Although it's not this kind about of that, argument is, is commonly used to get around the Bible's geocentric passages, it is presumptuous, superficial, and unscholarly, and in any case it doesn't prove the earth is rotating or revolving. It only proves that a Hebrew word can be used both figuratively and literally, but this is true of almost all Hebrew and Greek words. Of course, this has always been the problem in biblical hermeneutics. When can we interpret figuratively and when do we interpret literally? But here is where Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati merely paint themselves into a corner. When in their studies on creationism, Carter and Safati read Genesis 1, or Psalm 104, or many of the dozens of passages in the Bible that speak about creation, they invariably use a literal interpretation. Indeed, they chide their opponents whenever they deny a literal interpretation and insist on putting only a figurative or symbolic interpretations on Genesis 1. As it stands, Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati come to their chosen texts of scripture concerning creation with a conviction that they must be interpreted literally. Where does that conviction come from and how can they defend it? They do so from an inner resolve that God, who inspired it, meant it literally. So be it. The geocentrist, for thousands of years, has believed the same conviction about all the geocentric passages in the Bible. Dr. Carter and Dr. Safati might also claim that their literal interpretation of Genesis 1 is based on their firm knowledge of science. So be it. 
But when the geocentrist says that biblical passages that say, quote, earth shall not be moved, unquote, or the passage in Joshua 10 that says the sun and moon were stopped in the sky for a whole day should be taken literally because modern science has shown the equal possibility that the earth can be fixed and that the sun and stars revolve around it, Carter and Safety protest quite vociferously. At the same time, ironically, they appeal to Acts 27 to prove that even the Bible uses reference frames. So if there are relative reference frames, then how can their heliocentrism be proven as fact and geocentrism denied? Obviously, it can't. Hence this shows that either the science of Carter and Safati is inadequate, or they simply refuse to extend the courtesy of relative reference frames to their ideological opponents. Carter and Safati may then appeal, as they have done in other venues, what they believe are specific empirical evidences that the Earth is rotating and moving around the Sun, such as stellar parallax, stellar aberration, Doppler shift, the Foucault pendulum, the bulge of the Earth, etc., but this only reveals their ignorance of the current science. In the last hundred years or so, every single experiment that has been propped up as proof of heliocentrism has been shown to be no proof at all by the advances of science. This happened, as we noted earlier, when relativity replaced Newtonian mechanics in the late 1800s. More on that later. As for their appeal to Psalm 121 verse 3, yes, it is used figuratively there in reference to a person who resists temptation. But the figurative usage in Psalm 121 does not mean it has to be used figuratively in Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2, or in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 30. This is a fundamental rule in biblical exegesis that they have ignored. Let's look more closely. The word in question is the Hebrew mart, which is the word for move. It appears 39 times in the Old Testament, 20 of which are in the Psalms. The Hebrew cal form appears 13 times, the nifil 23 times, and one each in the hafil and hithpale. The Hebrew word mart can refer to things as simple as a slipping of the foot, as in Deuteronomy 32 verse 5, Psalm 17 verse 5, and Psalm 38 verses 16 and 17. And it can also refer to moving the earth internally as in an earthquake, as seen in Psalm 82 verse 5, and Isaiah 24 verse 19. Of all the words in Hebrew referring to movement, mart is used when any, even the slightest movement, is in view. Hence, it can refer to a shaking or vibration as well as a change of location. Mart, in the physical or literal sense, refers to the transition from a state of rest to a state of movement. In the figurative sense, it can be used to refer to moving from one state to another, as, for example, in moving from a state of stability to a state of instability, or vice versa. The point that is not to be missed is that Mart always has a literal meaning, since it means to move. The literal meaning can then be used in a figurative sense but only if the context allows. In other words, the basic meaning is literal, a possible secondary meaning could be figurative, as is the case with all Hebrew and Greek nouns. More on this later. Take scripture in its context. You have to look at the grammar, you have to look at the, the genre, you have to look at the surrounding phraseology. If you take it out of context, the Bible can say an awful lot of things that aren't mm. true, like, you know, God is an all-consuming fire, or as the rubber bell will be like a signet on God's right hand, and mm. all sorts of things like that. You can derive a lot of really fallacious theology from, so we have to be careful. And mm -hmm. here, clearly, the earth shall not be moved is not a reference to a fixed earth, just like the psalmist shall Carter's not be Carter's requirements moved, right? shall for correct biblical interpretation only beg the question. Did he use any of the five requirements he listed for correct interpretation on the very passages in question? Namely, Psalm 93 or 1 Chronicles 16, before he concluded that those passages are not teaching the earth is fixed? No. He didn't even read the context of the passages, much less examine them. 
Carter merely transferred the figurative interpretation he had put on Psalm 121 and superimposed it onto Psalm 93 and 1 Chronicles 16 without once examining the context, the grammar, the genre, or the surrounding phraseology of those two passages, or any other geocentric passage. Yet he was insistent that Psalm 93 was, quote, clearly, not a reference to a fixed earth, unquote. Perhaps if Dr. Carter actually looked at the context of these passages, as we did in Joshua 10, he might see things differently. So let's look at the context of these passages to see what they offer. Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2, says, The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty, the Lord is robed, he is girded with strength. Yea, the world is established, it shall never be moved. To thy throne is established from of old, thou art from everlasting. 1 Chronicles 16 verses 30-31 says, Tremble before him, all the earth, he has made the world firm, not to be moved. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice, let them say among the nations, The Lord is King. Now, let's look at the context. It tells us that Psalm 93 and 1 Chronicles 16 are portraying the Lord's majesty and strength, as a king who wears his royal robes, signifies that he reigns supreme over all the land and has subdued all his enemies. For the psalmist, one specific display of the Lord's power is that he has established the world so that it cannot move. So, like the throne of a king that does not move unless by his order, so God has set the world and will not be moved. In other words, the psalmist is using the non-movability of one to demonstrate the non-movability of the other. Obviously, in order for the earth to be an example of God's immovability or immutability, the earth must also be unmovable. If the earth moved, then analogously God would move and be mutable. As the comparison between the immutability of God and the immovability of the world is quite evident in the passage, the meaning of the phrase, establishes the world, is even more evident. For example, if one were to attempt to put a figurative meaning on the phrase the world is established it would be rather difficult, since the political, military, or cultural movements of the nations shift quite frequently and thus would not serve as a good comparison to God's strength and stability. Hence, the phrase, establishes the world, can only refer to the physical earth, not something figurative. Hence the best way the psalmist's analogy can have its intended effect is if an object exists that is unmoved in the midst of all other objects that are moving. If the psalmist is referring to an unmoving earth, then the imagery displayed by Psalm 93 is very accurate, for the earth would be the only body at rest in the midst of a sea of moving bodies in the heavens that are always changing position. The earth would be the only foundation point, the only immovable object, and thus the best example to picture the immutability of God himself. More to the point is that Psalm 93 verse 2 adds that God's throne is established. Logically, for the analogy to work, since his throne is established and thus does not move, then the world cannot move. The intended imagery is identical to the passages that call the earth the Lord's footstool, since footstools are understood to be aligned with the unmoving throne, not moving around it. In all such biblical passages the notion of rest for the Lord's footstool is emphasized, as in Isaiah 66 verse 1, which says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, what is the house which you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? 1 Chronicles 28 verse 2 says, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God. Psalm 132 verses 7 and 8 say, Let us go to his dwelling place, let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy might. To have rest from movement means the earth is motionless, which is appropriate in the earth's case only if it is not moving through space. Psalmist shall not be moved, the righteous shall not be moved. It's, it's different. It's, it shall not tremble, shall not quake, shall not be in fear, depending on the context of that word. Because of the specific definition of the Hebrew word, mart, that is, to refer to the slightest movement, 
some might argue that the phrase, shall never be moved, could also be translated as, shall never be shaken. If that is the case, then perhaps one could also argue that a shaking of the world could have some political or personal overtones rather than refer to a non-moving earth. But, as noted earlier, the political systems of the world are inherently unstable and the personal plights of human beings are that they often fall from grace, and thus neither image would make a good comparison to display the stability and strength of the throne of God. More importantly, if the proper translation were only, shall not be shaken, rather than also, shall not be moved, this would only enhance the imagery of an immobile earth, for then the phrase, shall not be shaken, would require that the earth be so firm in its position that it would not only be prohibited from rotating or revolving, but it would also be prohibited from shaking internally. Consequently, we can see why the Hebrew word mart was chosen, since it refers to the earth's resistance to even the slightest external movement. If vibration occurs, it will occur within the internal structure of the earth but not with respect to the earth's position in space, where it remains unmoved, in accordance with the definition of the Hebrew word mart. In other words, because of the specific definition of the Hebrew word mart, it means the earth will not move even an inch from its place in space. In fact, in the geocentric system, the reason earthquakes occur is that the internal movements within the earth are rubbing against the external forces that are keeping the earth immobile in space. The result is an upheaval of the land surface. Thus it is not surprising to know that over a million earthquakes happen all over the earth every year. The only other detail in Psalm 93 regards the meaning and usage of the word, world. As it stands, the Hebrew consistently uses the term in reference to the earth, not the universe at large. The Hebrew word for world here is Tabel, which appears 38 times in the Old Testament. In non-poetical contexts, Tabel sometimes has a larger focus than the physical world and may include the more abstract notions associated with existence, such as the totality of human consciousness, as used in Isaiah 24 verse 4 or Isaiah 26 verse 9. But most frequently, the Hebrew Tabel is used as a synonym of the Hebrew word, erects, a word that refers to the earth, as used in 1 Samuel 2 verse 8, Psalm 77 verse 18, Psalm 90 verse 2, and Isaiah 34 verse 1. And in the passages that Tabel is used without erects, Tabel always refers to the earth, or that place which is inhabited by mankind, such as 2 Samuel 22 verse 16, Isaiah 13 verse 11, 14 verse 17, and 18 verse 3. Most importantly, Tabel never refers to the universe at large. Hence, according to the definitions of all these Hebrew words, it is the earth alone that is kept immobile, not the universe. In the geocentric system the universe rotates around the earth once per day. So since the Bible really doesn't say one way or another, in fact, if anything, the Bible says we are flexible about what reference frame we can use, though the very fact that in Acts 27 27 uses a different frame from Earth is a precedent for our choosing the best reference frame for what we need. First, we already saw that Acts 27 is not using two different reference frames as much as it is saying that the appearance of the land coming toward the boat was an illusion caused by the fact that the incident takes place at night. If it took place during daylight, there would be no reason to say that the land was coming toward the boat. Moreover, to qualify as a relative reference frame, not just a reference frame, both objects, the land and the boat, must have the possibility of moving, which is not the case in Acts 27. Since Safati himself has agreed that the sailors in the boat already know that the land cannot move toward them, then they also know that the illusion of seeing the land move toward them must be scientifically wrong. Hence they know that one of the reference frames is always true and the other is always false. But in relativity, to the observer, either one can be true and the other false. Second, Safati's claim that the Bible doesn't care which reference frame we use is simply untrue. If the scientifically objective passages of the Bible, such as Joshua 10, 
must have a geocentric model in order to allow the story to comport with scientific facts about the motions of the sun and moon, then obviously the Bible certainly does care which reference frame is used. But let's accept, for the sake of argument, Safati's claim that the Bible doesn't care. As such, Safati is merely revealing the underlying presupposition to his analysis. That is, he chooses a heliocentric reference frame simply because he wants or needs it for the Christian apologetic with which he has sided. At the same time, he disdains and discards the geocentric frame. But since either reference frame can be true, on what basis can Safati choose the reference frame he likes, the heliocentric one, yet he knows the geocentric frame is just as viable and worthy to be chosen. In short, he has no basis. Just because, in his estimation, the Bible sometimes uses various frames of reference in its description of nature does not mean Safati can side with the one he likes best and discard the other. If he isn't doing so, then there is another basis upon which Safati is choosing the heliocentric frame that has nothing to do with reference frames in themselves. So far, neither Carter nor Safati have given us their alternate basis for making their choice. Curious minds want to know.